So I think the LR sits at about 4%. But annual growth is often many times higher each year, while we see print circulation flat or shrinking. So we saw a 35% year-on-year increase in digital circulation at BPL, while our physical circulation tracks 7% in the same period. And just before I move off this slide, you'll note the uh, January spikes, which are indicated by the stars. We see those <laughs> to a greater or lesser degree in all the libraries as well. The new Christmas e-reader effect. <laughs> Uh, E-audio use, smaller part of collections overall, but it continues to climb, and it shows the same kind of increases in use as the amount of content grows. Um, the star on this chart marks a point when we made a really significant increase in BPL's E-audio collections. We actually doubled the size of the startup collection, and the results were pretty immediate. And you can see similar spikes in data in the other libraries' circulation here when they invested in the collection. We just made another pretty big reallocation to E-audio in 2015, so we're going to be watching pretty closely to see what that does to the figures. <coughs> so moving on to some of the challenges that we've seen building digital collections, as all of you will be very well aware, ebooks are not just content, ebooks also require a platform for access. And what this combination means is that about six years ago, when we started to see a viable ebook market emerge, libraries found they were actually seriously challenged in their ability to purchase content that customers wanted. So initially we just had the one major content provider, that was Overdrive. And access to Canadian content in Overdrive at that point was really limited. So libraries were sharing <coughs> new content deals and negotiations, and there were no options at that point for content through other distributors. And we found that typically Canadian rights have always followed a long way behind US rights. 
As far as the actual platforms are concerned, we've actually been doing pretty okay in recent years, at least in terms of seeing the market open up. So we now have options beyond just Overdrive. We've got 3M's cloud library, uh, Baker & Taylor's Access 360, Biblio Digital, which we will hear more about shortly. And we're seeing companies emerge and strengthen in specialized areas of the ebook market, like Archambault and Cantu for French ebooks. And with a more open marketplace, we're seeing that vendors are actually more motivated to acknowledge library priorities and to make improvements to their products. But a wider variety of platforms isn't entirely good news. So one of the main issues caused by the combination of platform and content is that we can't always organize and present content the way that we'd like to. So for our physical collections, we organize based on years of experience with customer expectations. For digital collections, the publisher and distributor have traditionally dictated the organization model. And adding new platforms means that we have users having to access different collections via different interfaces. After several years of dedicated advocacy work, we've seen some really good progress here. So the Overdrive and 3M APIs were made available in 2013. This really improved access through the discovery layer. So getting those single formats in a single entry in Biblio Commons, huge improvement for users. Access to content is another area where we've seen a lot of changes in the last couple of years. So this was the situation we were looking at in 2012. <laughs> but the Globe and Mail top 10 bestsellers for hardcover fiction, hardcover nonfiction, paperback non-fiction and paperback fiction, 16 of the top 40 titles were available in ebook format, <coughs> and not one of the top 20 French titles. The situation now is a lot better, so the content on the bestseller list is at least available now for us to purchase. What we've seen happening with this increase in availability is an increase in pricing. In spite of this proliferation of different licensing terms, the average price of a book has continued to go up. So in 2011, the average price of an ebook was $20, by 2012, a year later, it was up to 35. And we're having to take into account things like having to repurchase <coughs> Michael Collins titles that expire after 26 circs. So I was talking to Ottawa recently and they actually provided the example that in 2013, they spent 78% more on repurchases of Michael Collins titles and only increased new titles available by 30%. Another really problematic <coughs> thing is when publishers sign agreements with single vendors, and then if you're not subscribing to that vendor's platform, you don't get that publisher's content. And with the proliferation of new platforms, we've seen the user experience get increasingly fragmented with multiple accounts and interfaces needed to access content. And while we've made some really good strides in terms of access, we haven't had the same success when it comes to getting publishers to move on pricing. So we're seeing a variety of pricing models, there's no question of that, but we're not seeing what we really want, which is models that are free of unreasonable premiums, price increases, and use restrictions, that make it hard for us to establish those diverse collections. So the landscape right now is dominated by our good friends, the Big Six Publishers. And of these, the top three in their imprints, so Random House, HarperCollins, and Penguin, account for approximately 50% of the total trade. And that's what the landscape looks like as a result. So this content matrix changes all the time. Publishers make content available, sometimes with challenging terms, then they take it away, then they change the terms, and this often happens without a lot of warning. There's definitely some good news here. I mean, you can see that in 2014, we had access to quite a bit of Big Six content that we didn't have in 2012, including the French ebooks, those were new. But the other side of the table is the bad news. That's the content caps and the pricing that vary so much from publisher to publisher. And that's what creates the budget challenges and makes content management challenging. So I'm just gonna walk really quickly through the uh, current um, pricing and licensing structures. The HarperCollins model, this was introduced in February 2011. Uh, this requires the library to repurchase up to 26 CERCs. Not the most expensive in terms of the individual title price, uh, but as discussed before, it's the repurchases that have that detrimental effect on the budget. And this is particularly true for content with ongoing popularity that circulates really fast. Uh, Random House, this came along in 2012. Uh, it does include a perpetual licensing title, but the price of an individual title is three times retail and it's high. $85 for an individual library ebook. You know, this is a model that can work for mid-list and backlist <coughs> titles that continue to circulate over time. It's really problematic for popular current content. And for VPL, this has had a huge impact on our hold ratios. We can't keep purchasing random house titles at this price. So our regular hold ratio is six to one. For random house, it's 10 to one. And you can imagine what that does to the wait times for random house content. Hachette, they initially pulled out of ebook licensing for libraries in 2010. <laughs> they came back in 2013, but with a model that was also not particularly ideal. So they have a perpetual license, but the markup on the title varies. In some cases, it, it is as high as three times retail. 
And it's like Random House, it's a model that works better for backlist and midlist. Uh, Macmillan, cert cap of 52 checkouts over two years, ebook pricing that's quadruple the retail price. Here we have a combination of a high initial purchase price and the limited license, so not great. Simon & Schuster, uh, more recent entrance to the Canadian marketplace, November 2014. Uh, their books are available on a 12 month term that then has to be renewed with prices ranging from $18 to $28. Uh, this is a model that works better for bestsellers, where we want to buy a high number of copies initially, we wouldn't necessarily want to repurchase a year later. Not as good for lower circling backlist titles that might expire after just a handful of checkouts. So, in summary, the changes over the last couple of years. Access to content has improved a lot. The range of platforms available has expanded. But on the flip side, we've seen an increasing complexity to the user experience as uh, the range of platforms has grown. And with more licensing models with time and circulation limits, we're seeing content that's just not as durable as it used to be. The complex pricing models lead to higher upfront prices for perpetual licensing and significant investment in repurchasing expired titles. That decreases the library's purchasing power overall, and it makes it really challenging for us to establish diverse and representative collections. And I think what we'd really like to see is a hybrid model from each publisher with a premium price for content where we want long-term access and a lower price for content uh, that we only want in the short term. That's the kind of flexibility that we don't currently have. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the advocacy efforts that have been happening in this area over the past couple of years and what's planned for the immediate future. And the advocacy work that libraries have been doing around this piece is so important. It's really key to improving access to collections and to resolving issues with the user experience. And it's also how we send that message to publishers that right now, the issues around our ability to purchase and maintain content mean that we can't deliver effectively on two of our key mandates as libraries, to provide equitable access to a diversity of content and to preserve content. And working together on advocacy is really important. It's hard to make an effective case for an issue as a single voice. It's too easy for it to be dismissed as well. You're the only one who thinks that or <laughs> wants that or has a problem with that. <coughs> so we start from the position that vendors and publishers are our partners, and the key to working together is to build positive relationships and a foundation of trust. And it is really important that we demonstrate an understanding of where they're coming from and the challenges that they face then we can build that reciprocal understanding of our challenges in building and providing access to strong digital collections. Libraries and publishers are both part of a thriving ebook landscape, and there are mutual benefits to working together to solve the challenges on both sides. And the message that we really need to communicate to publishers is that libraries are a critical discovery mechanism for content. Research has shown that people who read library books buy more books. It's good news for everyone. So these are the folk who've been working really hard to advance the ebook advocacy cause. We have the Culp eBook Working Group. They were responsible for the original 2010 position statement on downloadable and portable content, and they're doing a lot of direct negotiation with publishers. Uh, the CLA eBook Task Force, they're currently leading our advocacy efforts in Canada. Uh, Readers First have been responsible for some of the big gains in access over the recent years, and of course not forgetting the work that individual libraries are doing. So Readers First was formed in 2012, and they've done a really great job of getting the message out about eBook access and improving the user experience. Um, they were responsible for creating the guide to ebook vendors, published in January 2014. That's pictured here, and that enables libraries to evaluate potential platform purchases. And recently, what Overdrive have been doing is, uh, what Readers First have been doing is putting pressure on Overdrive to come up with a better method for authenticating users. And as a result of that, Overdrive is right now working on a new authentication method using barcode and PIN. So we wait more news there. The CLA ebook task force is leading Canada's. Uh, advocacy efforts at the moment. They've developed a set of key principles for term, content terms and conditions. And what these include is availability of content, fairness and flexibility of pricing options and terms, the ability to copy a text for print disabled accessibility or preservation purposes, resource sharing through mechanisms such as reciprocal borrowing, <coughs> interlibrary loan and consortia, the ability to transfer content to another platform within the terms of the existing license, and the ability to make informed decisions about the control and use of personal information, including the option to minimize the transmission of personal information. Oh, look at this. <laughs> That's our uh, anti-executable being a bit over-enthusiastic. <laughs> So as part of the uh, task force, Ottawa Public Library and Toronto Public Library have been really stepping up efforts at the local level with their boards jointly endorsing an advocacy campaign. 
they've done a huge amount of awareness raising with library stakeholders and they've really um, up the contact with politicians. They've been meeting with politicians at both the municipal and provincial level to try and spread the word. They developed a statement of acceptable terms and conditions, which they initially promoted through a province-wide letter writing campa campaign. And currently underway is the launch of a new public campaign, Fair Prices for eBooks. That actually kicked off just recently. I'm sure a few of you saw it go by on the local list search. Uh, here's a screenshot of the web page. So any library can add this information to their website, and then they can have their logo and name included as a campaign participant. So in BC, we've also been working away on the advocacy piece. We have a really good relationship with eBound Canada. We've been working with them to share information about our experiences and find projects we can work on together. We've also been working really closely with the Association of Book Publishers of BC. And our Director of Collections and Technology actually went to their annual conference to pre uh, present on issues around ebook licensing. And that was an excellent opportunity to help explain some of the issues we face and ways that we can support their goals. And a direct result of the conversations that happened there was our Read Local e-reader pilot. This was where the publishers gave us a one-year license to load titles onto e-readers so we could circulate them with content already available so the patrons didn't have to go through the process of downloading through the Overdrive app, which they were not having a whole lot of success with. Uh, we've been trying to negotiate something similar with Kobo without any success, so it was really great that the publishers were willing to work with us directly on it. And this is a great example of working with the publisher to our mutual benefit. So we were able to preload our e-readers, this improved the patron experience, it improved our return on investment in the devices, and the publishers got exposure and publicity for their content. And it demonstrates the difference that going to publishers directly is able to make. We saw immediate movement on an issue that we've basically been running up against for months without any progress. And it's a good example of what that kind of really local level advocacy can achieve. So to close, I'd just like to summarize what libraries can do to keep advancing these efforts. Uh, the first thing is stay informed. Uh, the CLA task force provides regular updates on progress. This is a really key area to stay aware of. Uh, be a leader in the province. We need people to be spearheading advocacy efforts at a provincial level. And be a leader in your library. I and mean, as some of the examples have shown, there's so much that individual libraries can do to advance the conversation in this area. And keep good data. When we have those hard facts and figures about what current licensing and pricing models do to collections budgets and workflows, we can make a much stronger case for the impact we're seeing on our ability to build diverse digital collections. That's things like the 6 to 1 and 10 to 1 hold ratio, the uh, Ottawa's um, instance of having to spend 78% on repurchases and only 30% for new titles. Really important information. And of course, continue to work on partnership opportunities for publishers and building strong relationships that help us understand each other better. A thriving ebook industry benefits everyone. And that is the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> straight into the next one. If anyone has questions, feel free to uh, approach me at the break. I would love to hear them.
So these are accessible just through our Biblio Commons catalog. Users will see the option for uh, to be able to do an EPUB download or to use the browser-based reader, reader, and you can see how prominent they have made um, wanting people to use this browser-based reader. So in all of the spaces in the Biblio Commons catalog where this title appears, you see a bright read, read now button um, over a less prominent download link. So. Once uh, you're in the reader, you've got the little download cloud which is going to cache the title and this also enables offline reading for um, titles, at least for the most part. We are still doing some active testing with that to make sure that it works, um, especially on mobile devices. We're not finding it as smooth. Um, <coughs> But browser-based reading in an offline capacity is probably new to a lot of our patrons in general. So um, you'll note there's a, it's a 21 day checkout that's not adjustable right now. So, and there's also no early returns yet. <laughs> so you can add bookmarks and highlights within the books. Uh, the publishers that they have, so Simon & Schuster content is really what has propelled them along to be able to do the pilot. Um, they also ha currently have uh, ECW Press. Random House, they say, is imminent. So they're doing some final testing with them. Um, and they are also working with Grey House and House of Anansi. So, um, and continuing conversations with the other big publishers as well. Once they have Random House, they do plan to probably take it out of pilot. Um, but in the meantime, we've been working with them to make sure that there are a lot of other pieces that are working. Um, they're also going to be ha they're also going to have apps for mobile devices. Uh, they have submitted one to Apple for iOS devices, but it was set back. They have to do some more tweaking on that. Um, once that's ready, they are going to go into a closed beta test with it, so it can still. There's no timeline on it really, and then Android app has, has just started development. Um, but on mobile devices, using the browser-based reading still works. Uh, Chrome browser is recommended. Uh, iOS devices, Safari also works well for the, for the vast majority. Um, and then the browser-based reading experience is, is pretty, I mean, you can see from how this layout is that on a smaller screen, it still works really well with the big cover images. Offline reading is as easy as just creating a bookmark. So not as many, if you're used to overdrive read, if you've tried that at all, um, and you kind of have to click a few places to get it set up, this one is as easy as just doing a bookmark, as long as it works. So we're gonna keep testing on that. Uh, Biblio Digital has been really responsive about the things that we've been bringing to them, the improvements that we've wanted, made, um, the reader that we were just in, there was no logout link from that, so if anyone wanted to be able to log out, they would have to go back to their checkout listing. Um, so they fixed that for us um, and added that, as well as customized the length of time when a hold's available until it needs to be checked out from seven days to three days. Um, and they, one of, a couple of the big things, uh, we needed to have the residency restriction enabled so that the experience was similar for our patrons with overdrive titles as well. And the other big thing that wasn't here when the product first came to us was any sort of designation about the different collections that are in the catalog. So it would limit out at 10 regardless of which ebook collection was being checked out from. So they've now released uh, with this nice little pop out that will be on both the holds listing and the checkout listing that will show patrons where they are with their limits on either of those. <clears throat> and one of the really exciting things about this is it actually allows you to use that browser-based reader with overdrive titles as well, as long as those titles are from one of the same publishers that Biblio Digital has. So this copy of the possibilities that I have checked out, you can see is actually an overdrive title. But you see in addition to the overdrive read link, uh, there's the read now button. And when we were in the reader, 
the overdrive title is in there as well. And as far as a patron would be concerned, that experience would be entirely the same. So patrons will see a couple of different things, um, and that's going to be one of the interesting challenges that will continue forward with using this. Um, they'll look slightly different when they check them out. They'll look slightly different when they're here in the listing, um, and there are then different ways they can read. Uh, as far as downloading the EPUBs, uh, for Biblio Digital Titles, they download into Adobe Digital Editions. Um, if you're on a mobile device, they can be read with the OverDrive app. They can be read with Blue Fire Reader, just the cover art doesn't show up. But so a lot of those things will remain similar and, and should hopefully work for patrons. So I will take these last couple minutes and show you the acquisitions module. also getting content from Biblio Digital. Um, they didn't have an acquisitions module, so um, they've done a lot of work on this. Um, it looks the same when I first log in, but there's an acquisitions link up here at the top. So selectors of the content will have the ability to do searches. We've got a long list of improvements that we would like made in this module, and we're going to continue to work with Biblio Digital on a lot of things to continue to have improvements, both for the patron experience and for the backend experience that we have. Um, there's ability to save searches. Um, there's some content lists that exist and that they can do some customizing. And there's also some listings of unavailable titles. They're not able to handle titles that have high, greater file sizes, really large file sizes. So in that case, um, although we may purchase the majority of our Simon & Schuster content through Biblio Digital, if there is something else and it's more, has a lot of images, it's a coffee table book kind of thing, um, we'll still have to use OverDrive in order to get those titles for our patrons for right now. So they're listed in here, but they're just listed as unavailable. are right now they're just the order histories um, that have come through so simple interface right now um, common interface and the one other interesting bit other than having it be uh, on the patron side these two collections that work pretty similarly but are also kind of different is the fact that all of the title information is coming from biblio comments so these will not be in our ILS so any of our staff that use that as a way to look at what's in the collection, those, those titles will not be there. Um, our cataloging department is also doing a review right now of the information that is coming through for the records and what they think of it and is going to be giving them some feedback on that as well. So exciting things and more changes to come with it.
Yeah. It's been suggested that uh, since the coffee's hot, we take five minutes uh, to grab some coffee and muffins, which I am going to hold us to. Um, and I'll 